Hello, I'm Barbara Seagram, and you're listening to Sorry Partner. Hello and welcome to Sorry Partner, a weekly podcast about bridge and all things interesting to bridge players, brought to you by bridge partners and friends, Catherine Harris and Jocelyn Starts. On today's program, we talk with Canadian champion Barbara Seagram about teaching and learning and getting people hooked on the game, her zero tolerance for bad behavior and the joy of combining a little travel with her bridge. Plus, she shares her top tip for developing players. But first, let's keep it. Hi, partner. How are you, Jocelyn? Hi, partner. I'm fine. How are you, Catherine? Jocelyn, I am very well, but I had an unsettling experience this week that I would like to discuss with you. Okay, what happened? <laughs> okay, so as you know, I have this bridge group that I have been quote unquote teaching for a few months now. Yes. Yes. And for last week's lesson, I told them they had to bring their devices to class, you know, their laptops or their phones, because I was going to hook them up with online bridge. Very cool. <laughs> right. Except that as I was driving to the class, I started feeling really uneasy and I'm thinking, what's going on? Like I was feeling really uncomfortable. <laughs> And then I realized I just felt like a drug dealer. Like I was about to indoctrinate these people. You know, it was like, oh, come on to the dark side. You know, I just suddenly had visions of them all never being able to sleep again. Next time they had insomnia, for example, being up all night playing bridge instead of reading and calming down their minds like sensible people that I knew it was a threshold and I was pushing them over it and their lives would never be the same again. Well, I think you're I think you're right. I don't know if you should feel bad about it, but for sure, <laughs> you are tempting them to the dark side and they're never going to want to leave. No. No, they're never going to want to leave and I knew that it was necessary, that it had to be done, that any serious <laughs> bridge player at a certain point needs to take that significant step. But I felt guilty. It was just hilarious. It's like, what is going on with me? I felt guilty, 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 guilty. Like I was Ugh. handing out alcohol to children. Yeah. Well, I mean, their children are not going to see their their parents anymore. <laughs> their job performance is going to suffer. Yep. And, you know, they'll have a glazed look in their eyes at all times. But that's okay. So do the rest of us. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I just hope they're going to be thanking me. That's all I can say. And if they find themselves listening to this episode, you know, I'm sorry, but hey, not so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter from Hillsboro, New Jersey, and I'm a listener and supporter of Sorry Partner. I just love the interviews. I love hearing the world's best players discuss their personal side, and I especially love the portion which they talk about the conventions that they like and dislike. So, I mean, I'm uh, very into conventions. I've been playing for a long time, but I've still learned an incredible amount from those interviews. I think you should support the show because it's just a fascinating take on the game of bridge. You hear a lot of perspectives that you don't hear anyplace else. Um, and I think it can generate a lot of enthusiasm and bring new people into the game. It's easy to support the show. You just go to the website, which is sorrypartner.com, and click on the Support the Show tab. And I hope everybody will join me in doing that. So, Jocelyn, we've had some letters in the mailbag. Would you like me to read them to you? Oh, Catherine, of course I would. All right, then. Here we go. So our first letter is from Richard in New Canaan, Connecticut. He writes, Dear Catherine and Jocelyn, 
I heard your call out for stories about a-holes in bridge. (laughs) Well, you're in luck. I have two for you. A while back, my partner and I were playing in an open pairs at a regional and we came to the table of a very experienced pair, one of the strongest pairs in the event. After one of them opened one no trump, they had an auction where responders showed both majors. I asked them what responders bid meant and the response I got was, wait for it, you'll love this, bridge. (laughs) Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I said, okay, can you give me a little clarity on how you two specifically play that sequence? What length should he have in the majors? And the response again was, it's just bridge. bridge. Yes. Now I was fit to be tied. I said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to be a-holes about it, never mind. This was the first and only time to date that I called anyone that at the bridge table. Needless to say, they called the director and they told him what I called him. (laughs) The director frowned at me and asked to speak to me away from the table. When we got far enough away so they couldn't hear, he said, I'm going to tell you a little secret and you just keep nodding your head. These two guys are huge (laughs) a-holes. The director is saying Yes. Yes. Then the director said, unfortunately, life and my job being what it is, I can't go back to the table and say, sorry, guys, he's right. (laughs) So here's what's going to happen. You and I are going to go back to the table and I'm going to pretend to read you the riot act and I'm going to need (laughs) you to pretend to care. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what we did. He told me that I had been very rude, that I can't be calling the opponents that at the table, zero tolerance, yada, yada, yada. And I (laughs) said something to the effect of, I'm sorry, Mr. Director, you are 100% correct. I need to be better in future. The important point is that I apologized to the director, but never to the opponents. And the director (laughs) let it go at that. And to this day, I wonder if the opponents ever suspected at all that they had been played lol love the show ladies keep up the good work best regards richard (laughs) (laughs) sounds like it's not the first time that that director has had to come and pretend to chastise someone for calling that particular pair a bunch of (laughs) a-holes no i know (laughs) but it does make me wonder about other director calls you know if you're at a club and you see the director being called over i mean are they just faking it Oh, yes, true. No, but never with us. They they all love us, I'm sure. Oh, they love us. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But also this, this pair, you know, I wonder if they've been emboldened to call the director even though they're the a-holes because the director's always super nice to them and seems to take their side. Mm. Has the director ever made you apologize to somebody when you feel like the opponent's been in the wrong, but you've been called an oh, you know, which reminds me, what about that that happened to us? (laughs) Yes. And he was from Connecticut. Oh my gosh. (gasps) I wonder if it's the same Connecticut (laughs) a-hole. There, there couldn't just be one. (laughs) But surely you're not saying that Connecticut is a hotbed of bridge a-holes. It couldn't be the case. No, 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 no. Well, I'm sure there's many lovely bridge players in Connecticut. So if you're, if you're one of the many, please write in and and reassure us. (laughs) Our next letter today is from Wendy in Canada. She doesn't say where in Canada, but Wendy in Canada writes, my partner and I were playing at the bridge club. The movement was such that the boards had a sit out where they sat for one round on a table. We finished our round and the boards were moved to the sit out table. At the next round, we counted our cards, sorted and bid. After the contract was settled, I looked at my partner's cards and said, why are your cards a different color to ours? (laughs) That's never good. Never good. He had no idea. We all looked down at the board and saw that he had not pulled out his hand from the new board. He had held his hand from the previous board, shuffled them, resorted them and rebid them, not recognising that he was holding the same hand as the previous round. Sure enough, the board we moved to the sit-out table was missing a hand. We couldn't believe we'd all missed it. Oh, gosh. I'm sure that happens a lot. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that happen. And that's another way that one can 
be an a hole. <laughs> you can really feel like some kind of a hole for letting that happen. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure the director was having maybe less than kind thoughts about that yeah. player. Gosh, what do you do in that situation? Complete mess, I imagine. I think it's a you know the board doesn't count. Mm, mm, mm. I don't mm. see how it could. <laughs> no, no. All right. Well, our last letter today is maybe a nice antidote to the a-hole discussion because this is from Howard in Columbus, Ohio, and he is talking about pickup partners at tournaments and how they're not all bad. Hello, ladies. I thought I'd share a story related to a letter you received on an earlier show about pickup partners at a partnership desk. I have been playing bridge for 50 years. A few years ago, I found myself without a partner on the second day of the Nationals after a horrible tournament to date. Though I personally detest looking for someone at the partnership desk, I had run out of options. With less than 10 minutes to the start of play, a young man arrived at the desk. I had a good feeling about him, so I introduced myself and discovered that he was a visiting professor from China. He spoke very little English, but I asked him to play and he agreed. We barely made it to the entry desk and our table, let alone had time to fill out a convention card. Two sessions later and we had won the event and even <laughs> had an overall finish the following day in the Swiss team. <laughs> he returned to China the next day, but I have his number, made a new friend and who knows, maybe we will play again at some point. Moral of the story, trust your instincts and partnership desks may not be too bad, even though my experience was self-service, so to speak. <laughs> As always, keep up the good work, Howard. That is great. That is so, so nice. I mean, it is always a risk, isn't it? You know, you throw yourself open. It's like, what am I going to get? So it's just so gratifying when you meet someone who's nice and you play well together and you have a great result. Yep. And if you have any fun stories about pick up partners at the partnership desk or a-holes then please do send them to us at sorrypartnerpodcast at gmail.com or at sorrypartnerpodcast on instagram or you can send us a voice message these links are in the show notes and on our website at sorrypartner.com along with some other good stuff coming up next our interview with barbara seagram Canadian champion Barbara Seagram is a bridge teacher, writer, and administrator. She has co-authored 36 bridge books, including the classic and our very first bridge book, 25 Bridge Conventions You Should Know, which is now in its 19th printing and is one of the best-selling bridge books of all time. She owns and runs the Barbara Seagram School of Bridge in Toronto and has taught tens of thousands of students to play. She has been the recipient of a number of awards, including the Kate Buckman Award, given to the person who has contributed most to others' enjoyment of the game, the Audrey Grant Award for teaching, and the American Bridge Teachers Association Book of the Year Award for her latest book, Play It Safe. She is a Diamond Life Master and a frequent speaker at NABC's. We began by asking how she discovered Bridge. Well, that's an interesting question. I was teaching nursing and I decided to stay home and have babies and not ever work again in my life. And my mother-in-law from that marriage was a fanatical bridge player and she sent my first husband and I off to bridge lessons. And that was the beginning of the end because he didn't really love it and I loved it. And so I fell in love with a bridge player and he married the babysitter, but I don't think you can say that. Um, but he did. So that's fine. So these bridge lessons, were these lessons at the studio where you had your first bridge teaching job? Yes. That was the Kate Buckman Bridge Studio, and that was in 1975. And in 1990, uh, my current husband and I bought the Bridge Club. How quickly did you go from taking the lessons to actually working at the club? I started working at the club two months after my bridge lessons. So you took to it right away. I did. 
and I was making signs and, and doing techie help and phoning people and recruiting for classes. And I guess two years later, I started teaching bridge. But no, I had no natural aptitude for the game. You know, I believe that less than 1% of all bridge players have card sense. I believe that you can learn this game by rote and that most people have to. Now, super experts who do have card sense will say this isn't true, but it is. Most people don't have that natural ability to know what to lead, to know what to play. And of course, card sense only relates to card play and to defense. It doesn't relate to bidding. Bidding is all learned, all memorized, all studied. And I studied like a fiend and I learned the rest and played with some good partners and some average partners. And I was lucky and I really loved it. When did you realize that you had this facility for explaining these complicated concepts to beginning bridge students? Well, I had been teaching nursing and I loved that and I loved teaching and I knew that I could make anyone understand anything, no matter how complicated it was. And so I've always loved that. Was this something that you realized was something that you could do with bridge, teaching it to beginning students? You knew that you liked explaining complicated things to people who didn't know very much about the subject. And did you realize that bridge was particularly challenging and, and therefore the skills that you had as a teacher would be particularly applicable? to bridge. Absolutely. But I think as a, as a teacher, I have gradually improved my skills through the years by learning to talk less and play more. And students learn so much more when they have cards in their hand and they're playing. And so I have tried to modify how much content I throw at them so that they're excited about this game. Because a good bridge teacher is a drug dealer. That's what we are. We're drug dealers. We get them hooked and we get them uh, excited or just hooked. And then they've got to come back for more. And that's what we have to, it, it's very important. Teach them the fun of the game. And there's an easy way for people to teach their children and their grandchildren how to play. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'll just mention it if it's okay. Everybody picks up their cards. We teach them to deal. And they pick up their cards and everybody announces out loud how many points they've got in their hand. And if you and your partner together have 24 points and the other opponents, they have only 16 points, then the ones with 24 are going to become the declaring side. And the person who has the most points of those two players becomes the declarer. And now the dummy is laid down at this moment. And then the declarer decides what they would like to have as Trump. The trumps get put over on the right-hand side of the dummy, and now the opening lead is made. So I tell people to do this with their kids and their grandchildren up at the cottage in the summer, whenever. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have taken up the game this way. So if you've got that luxury of those three or four weeks where they can just come and play, then they're more likely to want to learn more about the game. So Catherine and I, when we were first introduced, I think Catherine knew about your book and she instructed me to go and purchase it. And we studied it. We, we tried to memorize that book. <laughs> and in fact, this is my copy. It's extremely beat up. It's got highlights. It's got post-its all over it. And I even got you to sign it when you were playing at the club that I play at in San Francisco a few years ago. It's one of my most treasured possessions. And, you know, this was really meaningful. And I've used it with other partnerships as well, especially when I was 
just beginning and I loved the bidding right away, but I know that's probably not maybe everybody's favorite. But, you know, how does it feel to have had so much influence and have been so important to so many people's bridge development through these books, that book in particular? For the audience, it's 25 bridge conventions. You should know. Well, it's very exciting, and I, I love to get emails from people. I get hundreds of emails, and they ask me on page 25, uh, you write this, what what does that mean? And that's kind of fun, you know, because I travel a great deal. You know, my husband and I travel all over the world. We've been to 171 countries now, and I'm getting this email from someone about what's on page 21. And fortunately, I carry all my PDFs with me so I can refer to it. But, you know, a, a large thank you goes to my editor, Ray Lee of Masterpoint Press, and to his uh, noble assistant who now runs Masterpoint Press, Sally Sparrow, because Ray was the one who had this idea to write this book uh, on 25 Bridge Conventions, you should know. So I thank him all the way. And he has had the idea for many subsequent books. And then I started writing with David Bird, who's been wonderful. I, in fact, was one of those letter, those email writers. I wrote to you about Namiats. <laughs> oh, okay. I probably told you I didn't play it. You did. You you put me off on another expert who explained some things um, that were helpful. <laughs> good, good. Barbara, you said when you were learning to play, you studied like a fiend. What did that study look like? And were there particular books that you read? Uh, well, in those days, we really didn't have many bridge books to refer to. But I had a fabulous bridge teacher. He was a British man with a wonderful sense of humor. His name was Michael Davy, And he dictated notes to us. And in retrospect, you know, that's a harder way to learn because many people are not able to take notes and so now I provide printed materials. But in those days, I did take diligent notes, and I made up my own cheat sheet, as I called it. And uh, the cheat sheets I maintain really are the best things I've ever done. I now have five of them, one for intermediate, which is bidding, one on conventions, one on doubles, one on two over one, and one on defense. And I sell those, you know, all over the world, and people just love them. They're laminated fold-out sheets. And they've got a little bit of everything you need to know, and people keep them in their purse, and it's useful. What's one of the most interesting places that you've ever played bridge? Well, there, there'd there be two places. One would be in Botswana. We had a group of 50 people with us on safari. We went to South Africa and then to Botswana. And wherever we went on safari, we played bridge. Because we would safari at four o'clock in the morning, we'd get up and go on safari early. And then we'd come back and have breakfast. And then we would play bridge until two o'clock. Then we would rest. And then we'd go out again on safari at four o'clock. And so we would sit out on the verandas of these wonderful lodges and watch the water buffalo and the warthogs who were literally we were not up on any level. We were on, on the lowest level. So, I mean, the warthogs would be just wandering a few feet away and uh, the water buffaloes a little further away. But we weren't nervous and they didn't seem to mind that we were nearby. And it, it was wonderful. <laughs> were they kibitzing? They were kibitzing. <laughs> and another place was in the Frankfurt airport when we had a four-hour layover. We took over one of the lounges at the airport. And we set up a duplicate game and we played <laughs> for two hours until security came and kicked us out. And so we wound up the game, but we were able to score it and give master points. And it was great fun. Who's the most interesting person that you've met playing bridge? The most interesting person would be Eddie Cantor. He recently died. He was my guru and my mentor. He's a very special man. And you know how they say that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And Eddie had a way with people. When he talked to you, you were the only person in the room. I would write to Eddie at 12 midnight 
and tell him that I had to teach a, a lesson the next day on new minor forcing and did he have any hands for me. And he would write back and I would have four hands for my lesson the next day. And this is at midnight, which was nine o'clock his time. And uh, he, he was just amazing. And his hands, they're worth gold because my students just love them. So I don't credit my teaching with my teaching. I credit them to Eddie because his hands, every one of them has something for bidding, something for the defense, and something for the declarer play. And they're special, and I call them my wow hands. But Eddie was a wonderful friend, and his books are amazing. The two best bridge books he ever wrote, in my opinion, are Introduction to Declarer Play and Introduction to Defense. I had the privilege of rewriting those in 2019. I didn't rewrite. I just tweaked and updated. And they're just a, a wonderful pair of books for, for new players. Defense is such an important part of the game, and I know it's something that is of real interest to you. What do you think is the most important thing to learn about defense? Defense is the most exciting part of the game, and it's also the most challenging because as a declarer, you can see your partner's cards, which is helpful. But as a defender, you cannot see your partner's cards. So it's very important for partner to signal, but there's no point signaling if you're not watching. And that, of course, happens all the time. When I teach a lesson to a group and they've never learned anything about defense, they are blown away by the fact that there's so much that they can do to communicate and tell partner. I tell them it's like cheating, but it's legal because everyone knows these rules and they're universal. But it really is. The suit preference signal is just, it's magical. And you can tell partner what to lead back after she's finished roughing. And they just, they just love that. Is there a hot button issue that you're particularly invested in these days connected with Bridge? Well, the hot button for me would be getting people back to face-to-face -face Bridge. You know, you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. And while BBO did us a wonderful service during the pandemic, and we couldn't have survived without it, in my opinion. And also, it helped people to improve their game, and it kept them from being depressed. I mean, there were all sorts of good things. But now, people say constantly, I don't feel comfortable going back to face-to-face -to -face bridge, when in reality, they just can't be bothered to get off their tush and leave the screen and get out of their pajamas and get dressed and get out. Because yes, it is more convenient to sit at home in front of the TV. But if we don't support the face-to-face -face clubs, we will not have face-to-face -face clubs. There's something to be said for the fact that cities will no longer have face-to-face -face bridge because they can't afford the rent or the real estate as opposed to small communities outside cities or out in the country where they can have a senior center or a church or whatever or a synagogue where they can have, you know, less expensive rent. The other thing that's happening with face-to-face -face bridge is that there's a great, great shortage throughout, and I'm talking throughout the continent, a great, great shortage of directors because we're all at the age where we'd rather play than direct. We don't want to work as hard anymore. And so running games, they can sit at their computer and run games and make more money than paying high, high rents and only having 40% or 50% of the revenue because only 40% or 50% of the people are showing up. So Barbara, do you have any thoughts about ways that we can maybe address some of these issues? I think that bridge clubs have to treat their businesses now as a new business. And you're starting a new business. And therefore, you've got to teach beginners. If you're not going to teach beginners, forget it. You've got to start these newbies and people who are not yet addicted to BBO. 
and get them coming out and enjoying face-to-face -face bridge. Yeah, okay. So that's that's a starting point. But it's scary and it's disappointing. And my husband and I play bridge wherever we are. In fact, we don't go anywhere where there isn't bridge. With the exception, <laughs> with the exception of Cambodia, where our schools are, where we cannot play bridge and there is no bridge because any card games would be considered gambling. So we can't teach our students bridge there. <sighs> what a pity. Yeah, it is a pity. But we just came back from Rome. We played bridge. We were eight days in Rome. We played bridge at the local bridge club six times on a roof garden. It was just absolutely amazing. And then they had a little kitchen, and the chef made us veal scallopini and a three-course dinner for 10 euro at the end of each session. I mean, it was unbelievable. Wow. We were just in London, England, and we played bridge at the Andrew Robson Bridge Club. So we really are trying to promote face-to-face -face bridge. That's terrific. Can you tell us more about your schools in Cambodia? Yes. Uh, in 2011, uh, we took a group of about 50 people on a riverboat cruise to Cambodia and Vietnam. And we took bicycles to the school. The bicycles were for children of landmine victims. And my girlfriend, Patty Lee, and I looked up at the school and we said, well, they might need new bicycles, but they sure as heck need a new school. And so we came back to Toronto and determined that we were going to raise money to build a school. And so we were told that we needed to raise $24,000, and we raised 43000 that year. And so we built some libraries at existing schools. And now we have four schools that we have built and that we sustain. And in addition to that, we are building toilets like crazy at local government schools. These are all out in very remote, remote villages. And we are busy now building water towers for healthcare centers. Imagine the healthcare centers that have no running water. So they use water from the pond, the pond in which the animals bathe. So you can only begin to imagine. So we are doing a, a lot of work with that. We also work with an organization called Days for Girls, and they provide menses kits for us, and we teach the children all about that. And the building of toilets is also something very, very important. It's not a sexy subject, but having their own toilet for a family means that the women don't have to go out to the fields. And the fields is where, A, they're bitten by snakes, and B, they're sexually abused. And so it's a huge, huge thing. And when we build banks of toilets at government schools, other villagers can go and use those toilets as well. So we're very excited about the work that we're doing there. And in Laos, we put in thousands of water filters because their water is awful. And uh, the organization we work with also builds dams and brings water to villages that have none. And we'll put a link in the show notes about how people can get more information about this. Thank you. What's the best thing about playing with your husband, Alex? Well, he's a much better bridge player than I will ever be. He learned to play bridge when he was seven years old in Poland, and he has card sense. So he's a natural card player, and he puts up with me. And I have learned so much from him. Defending a bridge hand with him is, is it's really like magic because it just flows, and it's, it's really nice. But we can have our bad moments, too. But he's a joy to play with. But I will tell you that it we have a, a wonderful marriage, an idyllic marriage, actually. But I will tell you that the only time the marriage is in jeopardy is at the bridge table because he can get a little cranky. In what ways does he get cranky, Barbara? I know I wanted to ask that, too. Oh, well, at the end of a hand in face-to-face -face bridge, he would say, why on earth did you do that? <laughs> you know, but it, it, it used to be worse, but I am, it's, it's better now. But I created a, a program that exists throughout North America called the Zero Tolerance Program. 
because people used to be generally quite cranky and they could throw cards at their partners or at their opponents and they'd be nasty and they'd say, you idiot. And that is not permitted anymore. Now their score is adjusted. So they know that they have to behave. So do you wave that card at your husband? Well, he knows that he's got to toe the line. Yeah. And (laughs) when we're playing BBO, I get messages from him in the chat line, you know, between rounds, when you're allowed to talk to your partner, I get, what was that all about? (laughs) Yes. And I know I have failed. (laughs) And what would Alex say is your greatest strength when playing bridge together? He would think that bidding is my biggest strength because there's three aspects to the game, bidding, declare, play, and defense. And I I would say that my bidding is pretty solid. My dummy play is my best. Being dummy, (laughs) not declaring. I couldn't resist. What might he say is a weaker area of yours? Well, it used to be declare play was my weakest area. But during BBO... I have learned a great deal because I've played that much more, too, once a day. And then, you know, at dinner hour, we take the computer to the living room and we go over all the hands and see what we should have done, mainly the ones that we did poorly on and why it happened. And so that it's really helped my declarer play. If you could play with anyone, someone from the bridge community now, someone from the past, a fictional character... Who would you have on your dream team? Well, Eddie Cantor for sure. And I have played with him. He used to take his card table to the beach at Venice Beach uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, the kibitzers would all crowd around. And I've been there a number of times with him and had the pleasure of playing with him. I will tell you, it's, it's how I learned the effect of adrenaline on the human body or on the brain, because when you play with someone like this and you're nervous, the brain just goes to mush. And that's what I tell my students when they get nervous, you know, the brain goes to mush. But anyway, Eddie would definitely be on my dream team because he's always so, so kind and so nice he was. Bob Hammond would be on my dream team as well. And probably uh, Zia Mahmood. That would be my dream team. Sounds like a good one. Is there anything in particular that makes you nervous when playing bridge? Uh, When uh, when a very uh, top-level player comes to my table, I kind of have a a very negative viewpoint, and I, I do crumble, and I do do crazy things, and I just fall apart, and uh The brain does go to mush. There's no question. But then if you do well against said player, you know, you can dine out on that for a week. Those are good stories. (laughs) Oh, I would say a year. (laughs) At least. Yes, I agree with that. (laughs) How do you try and offset those uncomfortable feelings when a very good player comes to your table? You know, what would you maybe say to a student who is intimidated about an expert player coming to their table? Well, I've always been told that you're supposed to imagine them naked. That's never really worked for me because I, I, I don't see that that would be a pretty picture in most cases. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what you're supposed to do, supposedly, to lessen the fear. I don't know. I, I haven't found a recipe for it. I really haven't. And probably drugs would be the answer, but I haven't done that. What do you think it is, though, that fear Obviously, there's an understanding of maybe the difference between your skill and that person's skill, but we all understand that the cards are the cards, and if you play them the same way as everyone else, you'll do the same as everybody else. What's the, So what is the kernel of that fear? It's the fear of looking like an idiot. Mm. And it's probably harder for someone such as myself because people expect me to know what I'm doing and expect me to do well, and when I'm an idiot... <laughs> that is demoralizing, you know? So it happens. But, you know, I, I quite often I'll get a, a complete bottom board against one of my students. And I say, well done. And they go home happy. And I say, I'll be delighted when you leave the table. Because I get <laughs> bottom boards. Is it worse for you if you do poorly against a student versus a peer? 
No, I, I don't mind doing poorly against a student. I don't find that mortifying. I find it mortifying if I was to play against an Eddie Cantor or a Bob Hammond, because now they leave the table thinking, well, she might be able to teach, but she hasn't got a clue about how to play this game. And, you know, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that hurts. If they didn't know who I was, then it wouldn't matter because I would be just a chair. Right. And that's the other thing we're supposed to do to get the nerves out is just think of it as just a chair <laughs> that we're playing against rather than a person. A naked chair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what bridge goals do you still have? Well, I've just achieved one, actually. I just became a Diamond Life Master, so that's 5,000 master points, and that was a huge goal for me. The next step is 7,500, so I've just turned 73, so it, it's I've got a lot of work to do and a lot of tournaments to get to to ever get there. Alex is at about 6,500, so he's closer than I am. So I've got to try to catch up. I know that you probably consider many conventions to be like your children, but do you have a particularly favorite convention that you like to play? Well, we love puppet stamen, and we like checkback stamen. And I have my own version of checkback stamen that Alex and I developed. And if anybody ever wants it, they please email me at barbarasegram at gmail.com. And I would be delighted to send it to anyone. And anyone who's not up to date on puppet stamen, I'd be delighted to send that to them as well. So those would be two of my favorites. Is there a particular convention that you think is just awful? Clearly, you don't like to play Namiats. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there another one that you also despise? Well, I despise the concept of stolen bids. When partner opens a no trump and it goes two clubs on my right and I say double, then that's stamen, and that's an acceptable stolen bid. But in the social bridge world, when partner opens a no trump and it goes two diamonds on your right and you say double, they all want that to be a transfer. And it shouldn't be. It should be a, a bid that shows values so that, you know, your partner has the option of converting it into a penalty double, but it, it transfers should not be on after two diamonds or higher. So that if you want to play hearts after one no trump, two diamonds, then you bid two hearts, and that would be like a drop dead bid. Or one don't trump, two diamonds, you bid three hearts, and that would show a game going hand and, and long hearts. And of course, then there's the Lebensall Convention, which is very complicated. <laughs> yes, but that's one of the ones we did memorize in your book. Okay, good. <laughs> What's the best bridge tip or advice that you've ever been given or that you can share with our audience? Well, back in 1975, when I first took beginner lessons, I learned how to evaluate a bridge hand. And it is the most valuable tool I have ever learned. People talk about learning losing trick count. I find that it is not necessary to learn that. It's fine if you want to be bothered with memorizing it all. But if you do what I do with hand evaluation, what my husband and I do, you really don't need losing trick count. And that is that I subtract points when I have a shortness in partner's suit, and I add points when partner has raised my suit. So, for example... If I have a singleton spade and the ace, jack, and five little hearts, and the ace, king, and one little diamond, and two little clubs, including distribution, because I do beg everyone to always count distribution, their long suit points, it adds up to 15 points. So you open with one heart, and if partner bids one spade, I believe that you are now so disgusted and despondent and depressed and unhappy and nauseous that you must now subtract points from this hand because it's your spade is not an asset. And so you take away two points when you have a singleton in partner suit. 
So you now bid two hearts. So let's take the same hand, and now partner didn't bid one spade after all. You started with one heart, and your partner bid two hearts, and now your hand is just magical. It's all wonderful. It got better. So I tell people that your hand is like a flower. It either blossoms and grows or it wilts and dies. And this one just blossomed and grew. So you're 15 points. You've already added one, one, and one for card number five, six, and seven in that suit. But in addition to that, and this was invented by Charles Gorin way back when, you get one extra point for the fifth card in the suit that's been supported and two extra points for each remaining card in addition to those length points that you already counted. So now you're up to 20 points. And that's why when it goes one heart, two hearts, now you bid four hearts. Oh, yeah. From revaluing your hand. So that would be my most important tip. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's been so great. You two are doing such a wonderful job. This is a wonderful show. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed chatting with you. And play lots of bridge, (laughs) face-to-face. And that's the show. Many thanks to our guest, Barbara Seagram. Thank you also to our Sorry Partner posse of listener supporters who make the show possible. Sorry Partner is produced by Catherine Harris with production assistance from Paul Chirasso and Jade Gray. Our theme music was composed by Jocelyn Starts and produced by Daniel Graboy. Send your bridge stories and comments to sorrypartnerpodcast at gmail.com or at sorrypartnerpodcast on Instagram or send us a voice message and please consider supporting the show. You'll get a monthly newsletter and other supporter benefits. These links and a link to our discount offers and merch store are under the episode description in your app, on the website at sorrypartner.com, or wherever you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you, but be nice or we'll call the director. Until next week, play well. May all your finesses be on side. And remember, as Barbara says, during the auction, subtract points when you are short in your partner's suit and reevaluate your hand and add points if you can when your partner has raised your suit. That's it. Easy peasy. Thank you, partner. <laughs> Thank you, partner. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>